So it's 1502 on my PC. So uh, we are going uh, to start. So first of all, uh, welcome to this to this webinar. My name is Carlos Lopez. I'm uh, from Technical University of, of Catalonia in, in Barcelona, Spain. And uh, I would like first of all to to thank Emilio uh, Chubik, Professor Chubik, for joining uh, and. Uh, Thank you for the willingness to give this, this webinar, which is uh, brought, uh, it's brought to you by the React Technical Committee of GRSS of IEEE. So as you may know, uh, uh, some of the activities of the GRSS is, is basically to collect technical activities in the technical committee. There are several technical committees and we here uh, we are in an activity brought by the React uh, Technical Committee, which is Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technologies uh, Technical Committee, which is basically uh, an avenue for the people to join uh, in all technical activities and initiatives uh, uh, related with the environment on uh, how to monitor the environment, how to take care of it, uh, and so on. So if you have any, if you want to join the technical committee or to know more about our activities, I invite you to join the, the website at GRSS. So without further delay, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Chubieco that uh, will uh, give us the, uh, the webinar entitled Global Satellite Monitoring of, of Wildfires. And before to do that, just a few sentences about his, his background. So Professor Chubieco is Professor of Geography and Director of the Environmental Ethics Chair at the University of Alcalá in Madrid in Spain. He has received uh, numerous awards and he has also uh, been a visiting professor at uh, very relevant and important research and universities uh, worldwide. And perhaps the more relevant uh, information for, for, this, uh, for this webinar is is that the uh, Professor Chubieco has been the leader of the fire disturber essential climate variable uh, within the uh, climate change initiative of the European uh, Space Agency. So without any other uh, thing, I invite uh, Professor Chubieco to start with uh, his webinar. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for uh, attending this webinar. Um, as Carlos was saying, I am basically going to summarize uh, the work that we have been doing in the last um, uh, 13 years already uh, of, uh, for the European Space Agency. Um, European Space Agency uh, developed a, a program called uh, Climate Change Initiative, uh, started in 2010, that includes um, um, the aiming to develop long-term global data sets of essential climate variables. You have here the full list uh, that is uh, currently in the program. Uh, it has been different phases. And uh, now we have 23 variables. Mm -hmm. All of them are led by a European uh, consortium uh, that includes remote sensing specialists uh, and climate modelers. In addition to that, we have three parallel activities, a climate modeling user group, in which uh, the most relevant climate uh, centers in Europe, um, they are um, using the, these uh, Earth observation data sets to improve the current estimations of climate uh, uh, variables. Uh, we have an open data portal in which the variables that are generated within the program are being available to all uh, users. So they are free uh, and they are also documented uh, in terms of um, um, uh, uncertainty and, and, um, and validation. And a toolbox in which uh, there are some uh, um, software uh, facilities to work with these data sets. Um, within all the, the program, we have land, atmosphere, ocean, and ice. And uh, as Carol was saying, I am the science leader of the FIRE uh, CCI variable. That includes um, three uh, parameters, uh, burn area, uh, active fires, and fire relative power. 
but uh, in principle, within CCI, we are only uh, dealing with uh, burn area. Burn area is uh, one of the most important aspects of fire occurrence, uh, implying um, the extension of fire, the seasonality, the persistency, um, uh, and also obviously the whether this, uh, these occurrences are anomalous or they are part of the trend. So that's why we need long-term turns. Um, the beginning of the project, we establish uh, end user requirements um, and also a specific formatting uh, of, of the products that we should deliver. Basically, uh, all the, the products that we deliver have two um, different formats. One is uh, a pixel level in which uh, the full resolution of the different input sensors is, is included. In this case, we uh, consider the date of detection, the confidence level, and the land cover affected by fire. This um, information is very useful for many climate purposes, including atmospheric emissions deriving from fires, as well as, as uh, carbon storage. The, the grid product, which is the most commonly used by global modelers, uh, is, um, is a, a quarter degree grid cell uh, in net CDF format that includes 22 variables. Total burn area within that cell, standard error, fraction of observed area, fraction of burnable area, and the burn area of the different land covers that um, are part of the of the land cover CCI, another, another uh, variable within the program. Again, the pixel product is, is uh, produced at the full resolution of the sensor. And uh, the main variable there is the date of detection, uh, which uh, is uh, supposed to be close to the actual fire uh, occurrence, but not always, depending on the cloud cover and, and also whether the fire is uh, more, more or less uh, severe but it tends to be around the, when the fire is active, of course. And then uh, the, the confidence level is just an estimation of how sure are we that this um, detection is, 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 uh, is uh, adequate, let's say accurate. And then the land cover and uh, that uh, helps to uh, estimate uh, emissions, for instance, derived from fires so, or um, trends in, in land use, land cover related to fire to fire occurrence. The grid product, again, is a quarter degree and is mostly aimed for climate modelers that uh, tend to work at coarser spatial resolutions um, and includes uh, the variables that were requested by, by those users. You see, uh, this, uh, both, in both cases, we provide monthly files so they can, they can do uh, monthly estimations. Uh, in the case of the pixel, uh, the monthly fires include also the date of detection, so it can be also uh, produce some estimations at uh, day level. Um, we basically aim to develop these data sets from European sensors. Uh, we started to work with MERIS data on board of the MBSAT satellite that was active only during the about 10 years uh, between 2003 and 2012. And then we moved to MODIS data, it's on board of Terra and Aqua satellites, uh, because we have a much longer time series with this sensor. And so we produce also data sets from that. We restricted to the near infrared band of MODIS because uh, NASA is also delivering a burn area product at 500 meter resolution, and even, we didn't want to overlap with them. We also provide a prototype of um, uh, ABHRR um, product at five kilometer resolution. ABHRR, as you know, is a precursor of uh, some of the global sensors that we have now available. We started to work in the late 1970s, and therefore we have more than 20 years additional long uh, series of, of data. Um, obviously, this sensor is much less uh, precise that the current uh, ones, and therefore the discrimination of burn area is much more uncertain. But the still, I think it can be helpful for some purposes. And the most recent series is based on Sentinel-3. It's part of the Copernicus um, uh, constellation of satellites. And this one includes um, two sensors, 
one uh, called Orchi and the other one is LSTR. And we uh, use uh, Synergy Data, which is a, a merged product um, developed by the European Space Agency that uh, has three meter, 300 meter resolution. Um, these are the global products that we have used. And in all cases, we are these products are based on hybrid algorithms uh, in which we use active fires to guide the detection of burn area, uh, avoiding some of the problems that we may face in this in this uh, for this variable, which is quite challenged, because well, keep in mind that burn areas worldwide may have very, very different um, uh, behaviors. Um, well, boreal forests versus tropical forests or croplands versus versus trees and therefore they need to be uh, robust enough to cope with those all those varieties of of Bernaria signal um, we use uh, two phases so the first one aims to um, detect let's say the most clearly burned pixels and then applying contextual algorithms to um, increase the the, the, the core burn area to the total extent of the fire patch. They are locally adapted because um, globally we have very great, great diversity of fire signals. And then they are mostly based on monthly composites uh, to, mm. to cope also with uh, potential artifacts derived from um, clouds or cloud shadows or artifacts of the sensors. So this is an example of the algorithm that we develop in this case uh, for the fire CCI 51 product based on MODIS 250 meter resolution, um, but also is apply applicable to the synergy data from Sentinel-3. We use the reflectance, post-fire reflectance, uh, quality flags, the land cover for applying the masking of areas that are very unlikely to be burned. And also we always use hotspots um, because the detection of active fires is much more evident than the burn area. I mean, the thermal contrast with the background is much higher than for the burn uh, pixels. Um, and we use mostly bodies uh, in the historical series and more recently viewers, which is another sensor on board of the NOAA satellites, uh, which is now operational. So the idea is basically is to um, detect uh, candidate uh, burn pixels from the uh, from the post fire signal. Then we link that to actifiers. We create uh, clusters around the different um, the different uh, actifiers, and therefore we um, we can separate, let's say, large patches into um, smaller ones. Sometimes large patches are the union of different fires that collapse together. And it's important to keep the, the proper dates, particularly for uh, the estimation of, uh, of uh, emissions coming from fire. This is the list of, of products that we offer within Fire CCI. Um, the Fire CCI 51 based on the and um, the Fire CCI uh, Sentinel-3 based uh, on this sensor on synergy data. Um, we also provide data to the Copernicus Climate Change Service. In this case, there was a, a, a previous release of a Sentinel product that is still being calculated, but we will probably move to the Synergy product that provides a bit uh, higher uh, accuracy than, than the other one. So currently we have uh, the time series until 2022 uh, with MODIS and from 2019 to the present, with uh, Synergy data. We are now working with 23 and 24. And then also we have this uh, long-term uh, uh, ADHRR data sets at a much closer spatial resolution, uh, but going backwards to 1992. These are the global products and these are the regional. The regional products uh, also were um, interests of the, of the uh, European Space Agency particularly to see, to test the differences between using coarse and medium resolution sensors or even higher resolution sensors. Also the analyze, analysis of optical versus microwave sensors. So we have done several um, uh, data sets, uh, prototypes in this case, not, they don't cover the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole planet. 
Uh, but the, probably the most interesting as having two coverages uh, of Africa, the sub-Saharan Africa is by far the most burner uh, continent. And we have developed a wall-to-wall -wall mapping of this continent uh, in 2016 and 2019 using Sentinel-2 at 20 meter resolution. Obviously having such a much more detailed uh, sensor, we can also detect much uh, smaller burn areas and therefore the results are quite striking in comparison with the global products. I will mention later on that. And these are the users of our products. As I said, all of them are freely downloadable. Um, we have about, well, not, not yet, but about 2,000 users and it's growing the, the trend. This is an example of one of these variables, the FAR CCI 51, uh, again, long time series, 2001-2021. And this is uh, based on Sentinel-3, as you may notice, the, there is um, a clear difference between, sorry, there's a clear difference between the two. So the, the Sentinel-3 is showing much uh, more detailed um, detection, particularly of areas like this one, for instance, in the northern part of India, that is mostly croplands. And um, it's the, the, the system is much, much more, this algorithm is much, much more sensitive to, uh, to these crop uh, fires because of the use of BRS active fires that are much higher resolution than MORIS. Okay, so these are the sensors that we have used uh, for regional products. Uh, we have used uh, uh, synthetic uh, aperture radar images in, the, in three sites, uh, Amazonia, Indonesia, and Africa, Sentinel-2, uh, to global coverage of Africa, uh, two years, and now we are working with long-term Landsat data for specific uh, windows that are in interest of, of carbon modelers. These are the outputs of these uh, products. In this case, the, the uh, Amazonian database that we obtained from Sentinel-1 images. These are the three windows that we have been working in the last uh, months. Uh, to obtain long-term series based on Landsat data. And here the comparison between this Landsat in red with other global products that obviously they, they show much more burn area because of the higher spatial resolution. And this, uh, as I said, uh, we generate for two years, 2016 and 2019. In the later case, uh, using the two Sentinel-2 that are currently working. So they are, they are actually two satellites working in a displaced orbit. So you can have actually a temporal resolution of five days, which is quite good actually for fires because particularly in tropical regions, we may lose the, the burn signal quite quickly. And um, if we compare, as you see, this is the output of this product. And we compare that with the global uh, coming from either our MODIS algorithm or the standard NASA algorithm, the MCD64, we find out that uh, we detect way more, way more data that they do. Uh, way more means uh, almost double uh, in, in the case of ICCI and more than double in the case of MCD64. This is obviously related to um, both the temporal accuracy and the, the capacity of the TED earlier fires. And as you see in this case, we are comparing the fire CCI uh, small fire database with the GFET, a well-known um, estimation of burn area uh, used for atmospheric emission purposes. Um, and uh, you see that the, the total estimations coming from, from the difference is, is quite, quite, quite relevant, also almost 70% more than previously uh, estimated emissions. Most of the difference between the two products come from the detection of uh, small fires, small patches that um, obviously is very much related to the resolution of the input sensors. Um, in this case, we are comparing MODIS 250 meter resolution with Sentinel 300 meter resolution, but with better active fires. And here the 20 meter resolution uh, in which obviously you see that there is much more fires are, are, are observed here. And we are in the border between Mozambique and Tanzania. Um, obviously, this um, higher um, spatial resolution products uh, provide uh, 
much more detailed uh, analysis of the impacts of fire of different in different environmental um, processes. One of them is the impact of fire on uh, deforestation, tropical deforestation. We published recently a paper on this, showing that this uh, the new product in red is way more um, is providing much higher estimation of fire induced deforestation uh, re uh, with respect to the standard global products uh, that are shown here in yellow and orange. So obviously having a much more detailed burn area characterization, then we can much better um, also uh, assign the, the relevance of fire for as a driver of deforestation and also of emissions. This is also a quite recent paper uh, in which um, the, the bottom-up and top-down approaches are compared. Uh, for instance, here in the in the left, in the right sun, the, in the black line uh, is the estimation of a concentration of CO coming from tropomy, from one of the sentinel satellites dealing with atmospheric variables. And if we compare with the bottom-up coming from global, global products, um, this is the NASA one, a 500 meter resolution. This is the, the new, our Sentinel-3 product, 300 meter resolution. And in the red line, you see that the Sentinel-2, again, 20 meter resolution, are obviously much closer to the actual um, emissions coming from, from atmospheric sensors. Okay, all, all these products uh, have to be um, validated and also uncertainly characterized. The validation was based on um, a, a statistical selection of the sample based on biomes on one hand and also a fire occurrence on the other. So we selected a um, 100 uh, sites worldwide for the last um, seven years. Every year we collect 100 um, uh, sites um, distributed randomly um, in, the, in the different biomes. And in each case, for each site, we uh, estimate the burn area uh, within two satellite images. In this case, using obviously much higher resolution, we are comparing Landsat 30 meter with um, these global products at 250 meter or 300 meter resolution. So therefore, we can assume that this Landsat data uh, is more closer, let's say, to the ground truth. And um, in this case, you'll see in the upper part the values uh, in terms of commission and omission errors of the, of the global products. And here, uh, doing another specific um, validation exercise that use only Sentinel-2 data and only for Africa, we find out that the emission and commission errors are way better when we use high resolution Sentinel-2 versus the standard global products coming from MODIS. Uh, so the omission and commission is, is um, much better, in particular the omission, because part of this omission comes from a small fires that are not detected with global sensors. This is the, in terms of spatial uh, accuracy, in terms of temporal accuracy, uh, typically this is done using the date of the active fires. Um, active fires are detection of hot spots of thermal anomalies, and therefore we are quite sure that the date in which they are detected, uh, the, the fire was active, it was really burning at that particular date, and therefore comparing the products with the active fires is a way of, of measuring the temporal reporting accuracy of the different products. In this case, we see that there are some products, like these two, for instance, that are, um, let's say, in some parts of the world, particularly the boreal regions, they, the temporal um, accuracy is, is fairly low, let's say, versus other products in which the, the medium value, let's say, is the exact date in which the, the fire was was detected. So the current challenges uh, that we face uh, now uh, at the end of the MODIS mission that uh, you, most of you may know, uh, it is uh, coming to the end after a very successful mission indeed. 
um, but the, the sensor is now having issues and the platform. So we obviously need to, to move to new sensors and that implies an effort to harmonize, harmonize the existing uh, uh, data sets with the future ones that we will derive from other sensors, for instance, from BIRS. BIRS is not exactly the same, but has similar capacities to MODIS. In our case, we need to harmonize the MODIS uh, with the Sentinel-3, uh, these two products coming from our uh, project. And obviously, in both cases, uh, we have noticed that the, the actual burn area is much higher than what is estimated by global sensors. So we have also to provide a closer estimation to what the high resolution sensors are, are detecting. For instance, you, you can see here a time series of the different products that are available. Um, depending on the products, they have much or, um, higher or lower estimations, but in general, all of them have somehow a parallel train. Um, if you compare, for instance, this blue line, which is our product based on MODIS, with this product, the green one based on Sentinel-3, you notice that the trend is similar, but obviously the, the detection is much higher. I mean, it's um, significantly higher, like 25% more. These two points are the two um, um, Sentinel-2 um, data sets that we generate for Africa. And uh, you see that just for Africa, we get more burn area than the other global products produce or estimate worldwide. So obviously the worldwide um, effective burn area is much higher than the currently estimated, which is more or less in the range of 4 million, 4.5 million square kilometers. But again, just in Africa, we get data, more than that amount. So obviously worldwide, we will have much more burn area than it currently estimated. Actually, in a very recent publication, uh, some of the NASA people uh, have produced a new data sets. They call GFET-5. GFET is Global Fire Emission Database. So it's mostly emission, mostly emission oriented, but they also include the burn area component. And um, providing new formulas, you see that the estimations that they now get are way, way higher than those that have been pretty much being used by most people working on these issues. Um, I'm not sure if that variable is that high. In my opinion, it's too high, but still, um, the, the real burn area is much closer to the 7 million square kilometers than to the 4.5 4 million currently assumed by the global products. So another issue that we have is the detection of anomalies, the determination of anomalies, and particularly the impact of stream fires. Um, you well, the, from, from the previous uh, from the previous um, databases, we see that most products, or I think all products in general, uh, tend to consider that uh, burn area is being reduced worldwide. You see, from the 2000 up to the present. There is uh, most of the products indicate a convergence about producing fire. We are not fully sure whether this reduction is caused by the sensors itself because they cannot really detect the small patches, but most probably is caused because of land use changes, particularly in Africa, uh, from savanna to croplands that require less fire. In any case, uh, what really matters is that. Uh, the impact of climate change is not so much on the total burn area, but more on the occurrence of extreme events. No? And this is what we are observing in the last years. Every year we have extreme seasons in different parts of the world. And this is something that we need to study and, and analyze, particularly the drivers of those. Uh, what is well known the case of Australia, in which this is uh, actually an anomaly coming from our product. And we estimate that this area of Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, burn uh, seven times, seven times more uh, than the previous 20 years. So uh, it's a very significant anomaly indeed. Um, something similar occurred in the boreal forest in 2021, in which uh, the, as you see, the, the annual fire emissions clearly exceed the, the average of the previous years. 
and that was a combination of a very dry season in both the Eurasia and the North American boreal uh, forest. And very recently, a, a paper has um, analyzed the, uh, the trends in fire intensity measured by the fire relative power, which is one of the variables that is being estimated from active fires. And general, I mean, globally speaking, there is a clear trend towards increasing severity in the last years, which makes um, I mean, it makes sense because it agrees with the, our measure of uh, having more severe weather conditions, um, heat waves, or so dry seasons that obviously lead to uh, more extreme events. Um, Another challenge is the generation of uh, high-resolution global products. Um, the, there is a prototype based on Landsat from, by the Chinese Academy of Sciences that uh, is a bit controversial in terms of accuracy. Uh, we are aiming to develop in the next uh, few months a, a first global coverage of Bernaria based on Sentinel-2 which we hope will be um, accurate enough, uh, similar accuracy to what we obtained in Africa, which was quite good, actually. We also need to extend the validation analysis, and validation is very important, of course, and it's quite, a, quite a costly in terms of effort and time, and, um, but we need to, to measure uh, how um, the different products perform, and also how this performance is stable in, in space and time. And finally, also, we need to strengthen the interactions between uh, um, Earth observation specialists, uh, people generating data sets, and those that are using those data sets, particularly uh, the atmospheric and carbon modeling community. Well, this is the, the web page of the, of the CCI, uh, Fire CCI program. Uh, as I said, all, these, all the documents uh, and the data are available there. So if any of you are interested to get additional information on our products, uh, you have plenty of, of information there. Um, this is my contact. So if anyone wants anything else, I'm happy to, to answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Chubieko, for this clear and outstanding presentation. So, as you know, now we open the the floor for the people to uh, to make questions. So, we have already some questions on, on the Q and A and on the chat. So, uh, I would recommend that if you have questions, you write them on the chat, and I can uh, read them, or and Professor Chubieko can also read them. Okay, so. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, uh, Emilio, we have uh, a first question that uh, that uh, Reggie ask, is asking, uh, what is the burnable mask? Hmm. The burnable mask, um, we consider uh, water and urban areas and um, snow, uh, well, snow, permanent snow, let's say, snow caps. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, desert areas, so areas that are very unlikely to be burned, and that okay. is to speed the processing of the of the algorithm. Okay, thank you very much. We have a a second question. It's about the data. It's from Paulo Murillo. That is, uh, he's asking how often is the data updated? Because checking the GEE, it seems that the last data is from twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, well. The, the fire CCI is a climate is a climate oriented program. So we in principle it does not require to have let's say um, um, near real time operation. Uh, we are developing products for the climate community. But within the C3S, the, which is the climate change initiative uh, of Copernicus, the climate service of Copernicus, the product is being updated regularly. I think the last updates were 2022, if I remember well. Okay. Uh, but it's in the Copernicus data portal. It's not in the Google Earth engine. We upload uh, previous data to Google Earth engine, but um, 
this is not something required, let's say, by the program. Okay. Okay. We have another question, which uh, basically is a double question. First of all, uh, Ronald uh, Ontiveros is he is asking uh, which are the uh, the future projects to increase the spatial resolution of the global products, or which are the the the, the works being done to increase the, the the spatial resolution of the products, especially fire and uh, and, the, uh, and the land cover products. And in this case, is for the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Yes, uh, we are actually, as, as I indicated uh, recently, that uh, we are aiming to develop a global Sentinel-2 uh, burn area data sets for 2023. Uh, it will take a few months uh, because obviously, as you can imagine, there's a lot of processing to be done. <laughs> yeah, so we have 20 meter resolution uh, worldwide. It takes quite an effort to process that. But I, I hope to have it ready by the, in one year, more or less, that would be quite likely to have it. Um, <laughs> yes, in terms of um, of the algorithm, the algorithms are also publicly available. There is an ATBD of, uh, of all the algorithms, so you can take a look to them. Um, we don't upload to Google Earth Engine because we don't process in Google Earth Engine. Uh, the processing is, is also part of ESA. And this is done most commonly in the cloud uh, in the cloud services of ESA. They have their own data um, mm -hmm. centers, let's say, and okay. they okay. don't regularly use um, Earth Engine, which is a commercial platform. Okay. Okay. So that answers the second part of the question. So we have another question from Eric, and uh, he's asking, uh, how do you achieve the 0.25 degrees, the quarter degree by quarter degree data from systems where the input data is about 250 meters. How do you obtain this uh, decrease of resolution? Yeah, well, basically the burn area is, uh, we just compute the total number of pixels that are within a quarter degree cell and mm -hmm. sum up the burn area for a particular period of time. Now, regularly, we deliver monthly products and therefore, well, it's a matter of, of summing um, the, the area burn within each cell, obviously considering the, the latitude because that changes okay. the size of the pieces. Of course. For sure. We have, uh, we have a lot of questions indeed. So we have another question that basically is uh, asking, uh, how do you select the reference data? Briefly explain how do you select the reference data to compare? Yeah, well, um, we uh, we do a, a stratified random sampling, and the two the two strata are the the biomes on one hand mm -hmm. and the fire occurrence on the other. So we select, uh, for instance, boreal regions with high um, with high occurrence and with low occurrence, and mm -hmm. more or less this this. I think there are nine biomes uh, globally, mm -hmm. and each one is divided into a strata. And within that, we we allocate and the the target is a hundred a hundred scenes per year. Okay. And okay. in each uh, uh, these hundred scenes are allocated in the different strata depending on the mm -hmm. uh, on the actual uh, uh, occurrence. So we mm -hmm. give more weight to those areas that have more burn area, more fire. Uh, but there is a minimum number for all. So mm -hmm. we also take into account the potential commission errors of, of the areas with low occurrence. Um, okay, mm -hmm. go, ahead. go ahead, please. So well, the reference data that we use is Landsat, Landsat images that uh, are much higher resolution that, mm -hmm. uh, that we have. And since the uh, Landsat data are uh, taken every 16 days um, and that would may create problems with detections outside of that range. We do um, long, what we call long units, which means to, um, to um, uh, extend, let's say, the, the 16 day period by uh, pairs, using all pairs of images mm -hmm. until you have a lot of cloud coverage in which you are okay. stopping mm -hmm. the unit. So okay. we, it's a, a scene we may process, I don't know, 10, 15 images uh, to uh, have a longer 
a time series of uh, for validation purposes. Okay. So we have now a question about deforestation and uh, and Barnet biomass. So uh, Kiara is asking if do you consider all the biomass to burn or do you consider a combustion factor for uh, uh, for the biomass? Um. Well, a combustion factor, if I remember well, is mostly for estimated emissions uh, rather than detection. We detect burn areas is, is our main goal. Then in this particular study that I that we have just showed, uh, what we uh, compared was the evolution of land use, land cover, uh, and deforestation mm -hmm. and fire. So the idea was to, uh, to, to analyze what are the trends of areas that were burned, considering um, two years after burns, because in one year maybe the signal is not that clear and they was not removed completely. Uh, so basically, we are analyzing uh, the the history after fire, okay. um, with the limitations that we only have two uh, burn area coverages to analyze this. We hope to have. Now a longer time series in which this um, evolution, post-fire evolution, would be better uh, better uh, analyzed. Okay, so we have another question about comparing different products, uh, and uh, Nicoleta is asking if it is fair to compare the different products, and in particular, she says if it's fair to compare Modis at two hundred fifty meters and Sentinel two at about 10, 10 meters. Mm. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what what fair means in this case. Yeah. I, I think, of course, it's, it's necessary to compare it because uh, everybody is using Modis at global global products derived from Modis, and they may consider that this is what is happening on on in, in real life. So, <laughs> and this is not the case. So, you need to have a better spatial resolution. In this case, we don't use 10 meter; we use 20 meter, the 20 mm -hmm. meter bands. Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously, it's clear that whenever you have a higher resolution sensor, you will get many more burns, and this is more it's closer to reality. And we need to estimate what is in reality, not what the satellites are providing us. So it's important to compare in the sense of understanding what are the limitations and obviously the strengths, because okay. the problems in general, but obviously have a high omission error. I'm mean, sorry, high, high omission error. Yeah. And we need to be aware of that, or otherwise we will not be deriving good fire science from the products. Yeah. Cool. We come back to the to the validation, and uh, Afri, he, he's asking, he or she, he's asking if at the end for the validation, uh, you make any side level inspection, or you go to the field to compare your prediction or your products with, a, I guess, real fires on, on ground? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, doing global a global comparison uh, is impossible to do it uh, on, the, yeah. on the ground, no? because uh, we don't have the resources to be worldwide to do ground, ground analysis. So it is very, it's widely recognized that uh, you can consider closer to ground truth whenever you have high resolution sensors. Okay. Obviously, Landsat data also has potentially omission or commission errors. And in this case, we have checked Landsat with higher resolution, like Sentinel-2 or even Planet, which is three meter resolution. Uh, so, and, and uh, obviously there is an error there, but it's much, much lower yeah. than the global products. Mm -hmm. So, yes, uh, continuing with this question, have you uh, considered to use uh, the, the data from these commercial constellations that are now being put in the space where the temporal resolution is very high, but maybe the optical quality of the data is not that high? Hmm. Yeah, actually in the new phase, uh, we will be this uh, global product based on Sentinel-2 will be validated somehow with planet data. Um, okay. In that okay. case, we um, there is another group we, because we want to keep the independence in the validation process. Um, they will be using automatic uh, algorithms, but also with a lot of visual inspection. Because okay. yes, okay. I agree that planet data is uh, very good in terms of spatial, but not so much in terms of spectral. 
and quality and uh, they, they, they need they, they need to be um double checked let's say from by visual inspection okay so another question from peter uh, this is very interesting is this, which products have you found to have the highest temporal resolution in the most fire prone areas of the globe uh well temporal and in, in temporal reporting accuracy you mean i mean the the I guess so. Yeah, temporal resolution. I mean, there are modis is daily observations, but uh, depending on the algorithm, uh, for instance, our product, uh, we, we rely on on uh, monthly composites, and therefore the temporal reporting accuracy was not that good. It was much low, much better than NASA, the NASA mm -hmm. product, the standard NASA product. We have changed the algorithm since then, and now the Sentinel-3 product uh, is much higher, special uh, temporal reporting accuracy. So in, I would say that nowadays both the MCD64 and the 5 cci mm -hmm. Sentinel-3 uh, have a similar temporal resolution. Yeah, obviously mm -hmm. with Landsat or Sentinel, you have uh, every 16 days, every five days, and uh, you have much, much poorer temporal resolution than the global sensor. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, uh, now we have two questions as I think that you more or less have already answered. The first is uh, regarding validation in uh, countries with limited reference maps. But, uh, but uh, as you mentioned, you are making that validation with other systems. So uh, that, 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 uh, that validation would be, would be done on, on areas where you don't have on ground real measurements. Yeah. And well, actually, the, the, the statistics uh, coming from fire services, forest fire services, mm -hmm. are not that reliable sometimes, no, because okay. they. They use different techniques for doing that. They sometimes rely on field work or sometimes a helicopter mm -hmm. flying. Mm -hmm. So you really don't need to have a national fire information for doing that. You just need to have access to satellite data at proper spatial resolution and you really have a well-trained interpreters no, to be sure that what you are detecting as burn patch is in fact a burn patch and not something else. No? <clears throat> and here is... Uh... A quite very interesting question that, for instance, is also relevant here in Spain, is that if it is possible to distinguish between fire or burnings, I think uh, produced by, by human activity or on purpose from wildfires using satellite imagery. Mm. Um, well, that maybe the, there is some um, indirect uh, ways, but I, I don't... I don't see clearly how can you distinguish between. Um, well, we could distinguish between prescribed fires, though that are intentionally burned mm -hmm. to uh, manage uh, vegetation, from wildfires in the sense that typically prescribed fires are much smaller in size. But uh, in terms of whether the fires are uh, deliberately caused, uh, mm -hmm. they are human caused or not, I I don't think we can really do it at this point. The okay. cause. It's quite tricky, even from a ground point of view. I mean, there are services that do that, and it's not always simple. Yeah, yeah. So another question, uh, which basically go, points into the direction of what you mentioned on uh, high-resolution estimation of uh, fire information. So basically, uh, uh, this person is asking if you could give some light on uh, on the analysis of these uh, local local scale fires, because mm -hmm. it, it is relevant, and maybe there are he, he puts uh, different different questions, but but perhaps also going into the direction of the previous question is that if you could differentiate between uh, crop fires, crop burning, and wildfires, and I, I suppose is you can directly give from from the land cover, but if you could give more insight on how do you or how, how do you see the, the analysis of the high resolution information yeah well obviously for local for local scales and uh, relatively small regions i definitely would recommend to use sentinel 2 or landsat or the combination of the two because you can you can combine landsat and sentinel 2 and you will have a very high temporal resolution from those and um, obviously this need to be uh, related also to the land cover of the region. So you mm -hmm. can derive land cover maps uh, from these sensors uh, using classification, well-known classification techniques. And that, that would be the, the easiest way to distinguish between crop 
burnings and mm -hmm. wildfires. Even though we we'll keep in mind that at least uh, from the areas I know, sometimes crop burning uh, become wildfires because uh, they uh, they start burning in in residues of crops, and then because of the wind conditions, they the sparks are mm -hmm. going to the shrubs or to the forest, and then became a a forest, uh, a, mm -hmm. a forest fire. Uh, but in principle, yes, I would recommend to do uh, at least um, Landsat or Sentinel-2 oh. uh, resolution and really focus much more on local patterns. Okay, so we have uh, plenty of questions. So uh, again, thanks for the presentation. I mean, if uh, one person is asking if you could elaborate more about the estimation uh, of the severity of the fire. So how do you can how you could retrieve that information, or how how important? Also, I, I think this person is going into the direction of um, and how these extreme fires is becoming more important, as we have seen one or two years ago in Canada. Yeah. Well, yes. In principle, the fire CCI. Um, program is not requesting to develop severity. Um, so we are not developing this variable within the, the fire CCI, but we are interested uh, on this issue. We have been working on that with local fires in Spain for the last uh, 20 years already. Um, and there are there are some there is some capacity of analyzing severity post fire by comparing pre and post fire images. Mm -hmm using optical data on one hand, but also LIDAR. LIDAR is quite useful for that because it can give you an idea of the biomass consumed by the fire. Um, another parameter that is well known, well, very critical, let's say, for um, atmospheric modelers is combustion completeness, which is actually the proportion of biomass that are, have been consumed by the fire. This is a bit complex to, to compute, but there are also some possibilities there, for instance, relating to the energy that has been derived from the fire. So yeah, this is an interesting field of, of research. Oh, yeah. Even oh, yeah. this, I didn't mention that because I was most focusing on global aspects and we didn't do a global scale anything on severity. Okay. So now a very, very, very important question. I mean, very important question is that uh, if, if you know up to your knowledge, if there are any project to perform barnet area detection based on deep learning on or an AI. And my my question would be, uh, how do you foresee the future of applying those techniques to uh, the processing of fires uh, with AI? Hmm. Well, uh, I am not an expert on, on AI, on artificial intelligence, but uh, certainly, is, um, I mean, theoretically speaking, is one of the most obvious applications of, of those algorithms. Um, they aim to, to recognize, let's say, patterns, and, well, burn area is, is, uh, it has uh, some pattern <laughs> that is, uh, even though there are very different types of, different types of files, but I do, I do believe that uh, deep learning could be quite useful for that. Obviously, you would need to create a huge library of burn um, areas around the world to be sure that the quality of the detection is is um, mm -hmm. reliable. I don't know yet any uh, operational algorithm that is doing that. Uh, there are several papers published on specific areas, mm -hmm. but um, well, I mean, uh, classifying a, a local fire is fairly easy. Uh, going to the to a continent or to global mm -hmm. is much more challenging. Yeah. Yes. And now the uh, also a very curious and important question is that how often does the smoke of the fires disrupt uh, your high temporal resolution estimation of permanent areas? Mm. Um, well, that's a good question. Actually, clouds and dense smoke are an issue, of course, uh, because we are using reflectances. And that's why we use also active fires because the thermal signal is much more clear and um, intense fires can can be observed even with dense smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of reflectances, uh, it takes a few days. That's why the detection is always a bit delayed when you have a very high plumes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, those plumes, um, I mean, in general, they don't 
tend, they don't tend to last a long. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe several hours or maybe a few days, but not really. They are not. They don't last as much as the actual burn patches, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in some areas, um, very remote areas that, where fires can be active for many weeks or even months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there is another question about validation. In the previously we 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 were analyzing validation in countries where do you you don't have information. But this Peter is asking uh, for validation in countries where you have fire agencies like USA, like Australia, where mm -hmm. they even provide the perimeter of the fire. So so uh, Peter is asking how do you compare the area or the Barnett area you estimate from satellite in, for Earth observation data compared to this information provided by the fire agencies? Yeah. Well, actually, these two examples, Australia and USA, they, they use satellites to, to do their own estimations. There are very few people who does ground perimeters now because, I mean, large fires is very unfeasible to do ground ground estimation. Obviously, they they go to the ground to maybe estimate where there was the ignition point or maybe to solve some mm -hmm. of the issues. But most of these databases, I mean, the ones I know in USA or Canada, are mostly based on satellite data. Obviously, these um, perimeters tend to be very uh, controlled, very supervised by the experts, mm -hmm. and they know more or less the the shape and the area affected. So they probably are good quality, but um, you never know. No? Sometimes the agencies depend on the, on the agency, <laughs> the quality of the perimeters may be different. No? So yeah. in practical yeah. terms, I would say that um, most of the agencies, they use satellite as well as we do. And depending mm -hmm. on the on the expertise of the, of the person, the, the final perimeters may be as accurate or more accurate or less accurate than ours. Okay, uh, Camilo is asking about where to find the scientific papers of this project. So I guess most of the information can be found in the website, as you mentioned. So, sure. so the, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, information, yeah. I guess, is there. And there is another question by Ana Maria. If uh, she's asking if it's possible to estimate from the information to the uh, you derive, the velocity of the fire? Well, to some extent, let's say, because um, with MODIS, we have daily observations, um, both uh, burn area and active fires. So um, um, what happened in, in between that, we don't know. We, we only know that uh, day T, uh, the fire arrived here, and day T plus one arrived there. <laughs> Okay. So that's that's the best you can do. Obviously, uh, if you want to know in detail the rate of spread, you should have a much um, much more frequent uh, observation mm -hmm. uh, um, that that we do have now. Um, well, there are good news in this regard because the, I don't know if you're aware that the Meteosat third generation was launched a few months ago. And they have increased spatial resolution in the channels that are used for active fire. Mm -hmm. So that, that we could, at least in Europe, generate about one square kilometer um, detection every 10 minutes. And that is quite, quite significant. So obviously, there should be fairly large fires, but still, I think we should be able to, to get these type of parameters that uh, so far they were only available with helicopters or with oh, uh, balloons. So no, we, that's a very under, under sensors on 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 the area. <laughs> okay, so now uh, from what I see is the last question I have in the chat. So Nicoletta is asking that uh, your validation approach in, the, in your validation approach, you mentioned that you allocate hundred per stratum. Okay, so it's about uh, hundred polygons, hundred pixels, or something else. Well, actually, none of them is <laughs> a hundred scenes. For the whole world, yeah. well, so that means that in each a scene, each a scene is uh, an area of um, a hundred by a hundred kilometers, and we um, we um, detect all burn patches within that region. So yeah. it's a ten thousand square kilometers, okay. Uh, okay. and um, 
the allocation, as I said, is done in a stratified random sampling. So at least we should have two uh, scenes in each uh, strata. With those that have a higher um, occurrence, we will have more, of course. Okay. So there are many more than 100 polygons for a stratum, of course. Okay. <laughs> because okay. It's a scene, it has plenty of polygons, yes. Okay. And many, so, many pixels, of course. Sure. So as far as I see, there are no more questions in the chat. Uh, so it's uh, 1601. So are there any other final question, final, final comment? Of course, there are plenty of congratulations for your presentation. I mean, the people seem to be, to be super happy with, with this topic, which is totally relevant today, OK? Here in Spain and worldwide, so. Good, good to know. So <laughs> if, if there is uh, no, other que no other question or comment, so I would like. Uh, here we have uh, a question. Uh, here, uh, Chen Hao Wang, he's asking that he has been uh, using fire CCI to study a burned area uh, for a city, OK? Uh, and he was founding that he, he was uh, funding um, Barnet pixel in, in urban areas. How could this be possible if those areas were removed, as you mentioned before? Mm. Well, we should ask the land cover people because we rely on the land cover CCI. We don't develop land cover ourselves. So mm, we assume that the quality of the land cover is good enough. But obviously, keep in mind that uh, this is a global product. And global products means uh, that the resolution, I mean, that the quality is uh, very much uh, dependent on the on the uh, let's say on the inputs and the areas. Some areas some are more difficult mm -hmm. than others. Uh, so it's a product that is fairly reliable. It's been used by many people already, but uh, we cannot assure that it's working perfectly in every single city in the world. Of course, this is something that okay. Uh, okay. No, obviously a limitation of the data. Uh, there is a final question about plumes, but you already answered that question. That I mean, these plumes do not uh, really uh, take a look, uh, uh, they, would, would learn, uh, they don't last too much time, is what you mentioned, okay? So there is another question, so there's plenty of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, one person is asking if uh, uh, that, uh, they found that using Fire CCI uh, against uh, MCD64 mm -hmm. in the savannas in Indonesia, okay, were performing better than Fire CCI. Why do you think it's performing better Fire CCI than MCD64 on those particular areas? Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, I cannot assure, of course, because I don't, I'm not familiar with the region, but um, my only guess would be that we that the product has a, a better spatial resolution. I imagine you are talking about Fire CCI 51, and this product was based on Modis 250 meter resolution, while MCD 64 is 500 meter resolution. They have more bands, let's say, so the principle, the algorithm is more, more robust, but they may be a little bit lower in terms of a spatial detecting mm -hmm. small patches. But um, I don't think that can be generalized. I, I wouldn't say that the art product is better than, their, than mm -hmm. theirs. I, I do believe our more recent product of, based on Sentinel-3 uh, is a bit more reliable than MCD-64 because we are using better active fires and the, the three, meter, three meter resolution of Sentinel-3 includes also the soft with infrared bands that were not used in our previous algorithm. So I think the new version should be better, but um, it's good to know that in your case it's working well. <laughs> okay. So now yeah, that's it. I mean, this is the, the last question. So first of all, I would like to thank you, Professor Chubieko, for accepting the invitation and for illuminating us uh, with this uh, very clear uh, presentation and the clarity of his, uh, his answers. And uh, okay, so. That's all. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Take care.